Thank you very much. Mm. It's a great pleasure to be here. And this slide, perhaps, is perhaps the only slide you need to take home with you today. Because it is usual when people speak at health or social care conferences to talk about a burden, a tidal wave, the problem. And in fact, I think we've got to turn this around. And the key to the sustainability of working with older people is to realize that we've got a longevity dividend. This fantastic piece of work is three meters by three meters. It hits you like a, a blow when you go into the Tate Modern. It's bright, it's invigorating, it's radical, it's a change for the artist, and it's created at the age of 83. And it's a potent metaphor for what we gain. And allied to that is the fact that Matisse, at this age, was actually quite disabled. So what we've got is in one painting a metaphor for the key hallmark of aging, which is complexity. And our great challenge is that society tries to simplify aging, to portray it as a burden, to portray it as loss, whereas in fact you've got growth and loss at all ages. There are things you could do at two that you can no longer do when you're seven. You'll never learn a language again, you'll never learn to walk again. Whole billions of neurons have shut down between the ages of two and seven. But we don't think of this as a loss, we think of this as something that's a part of growth. So growth and loss occur at all ages, and this is complexity. And yet, when it comes to looking at how older people are portrayed in the media, we have to mention Bono being an Irish speaker, very often the language and the discourse is that of loss, of memory. But how do we do as care workers? And I think this is a major challenge. Do we talk, for example, about carer burden all the time? Most carers want to care. Actually, what they want to talk about are the burdensome aspects of care. So, uh, is our task sophisticated, effective and rewarding care for valued citizens with complex needs? Are we the guardians of the longevity dividend? Or is this some worthy task of coping with the demographic time bomb at Tsunami? And that's the big challenge to us. And if we don't revisualize this in terms of guardians of the longevity dividend, then we're fighting a losing battle. And again, look at the language. This is one of the great pioneers of geriatric medicine, Ignaz Nasher, a Viennese man who invented the word, wrote the first textbook. Look at the words. We realize that for all practical purposes, the lives of the aged are useless, that they are often a burden to themselves, their family and the community at large. Their appearance is generally unesthetic, their actions objectionable, their existence often an incubus to those whom their humanity or duty take upon themselves the care of the aged. And this language is still there. We've just done a survey of gerontology textbooks on normal cognitive aging for care workers, and none of them talk about the gains we make with aging. They all talk about the losses. And indeed, here we must turn to the words of the great Robert Butler, the man who coined the word ageism. And he talks about the tragedy of old age is not the fact that each of us must grow old and die, because that's the greatest social advance of the last century, but that the process of doing so has been made unnecessarily and at times excruciatingly painful, humiliating, debilitating and isolating through insensitivity, ignorance and poverty. And the key challenge to social services and social networks is to ensure that we do not have an ignorance about the complexity and richness of ageing. And this turns up time and time again and I'm going to tell you a good news story and this is the beginning of a not so good news story. Most of you probably think this is fine. This was a, the last of a series of articles in The Lancet about human rights and healthcare. But in fact, there's something missing from this slide. And what's missing from this slide is humane, competent, and compassionate elder care. We would like our airline pilot to be humane and compassionate, but we'd also like him to be competent. Similarly, our cardiac surgeon, our doctor, our child social worker, so why not people who work with older people? And the key challenge is we have let expertise in gerontology become discretionary, something you pick up when you go along with the job. And as I will show you, gerontological expertise saves lives, time and money across all sectors of care. The background to this is perhaps best understood through Susan Sontag's magisterial illness uh, uh, as metaphor. 
She had breast cancer at a time when it was poorly seen in society, and this was mirrored in the services. And she talked about illness being on the night side of life, a more onerous citizenship. Everyone who is born holds a dual citizenship. So we are all the present ill or the future ill as well as what we are now. And it's impossible to take up residence unprejudiced by the lurid metaphors with which it has been landscaped. So if our discourse is of loss and disability, well then our services will reflect that. And we ourselves have to reflect, what does this mean for me personally? Am I truly happy at the prospect of being old? And I think that's a challenge that must be thrown back to each of us, because unless we learn to say, yes, this is fantastic, yes, I'm going to lose things, but I'm going to grow, and are we planning for complexity? So it's a very personalized decision. And art comes to our rescue here, because instead of Bono with his extra four legs, look at these eight legs. This is Louise Bourgeois' fantastic spider at the Tate. This is the sort of contribution, this is a metaphor for the richness we gain. Older drivers, for example, have the highest level of disabilities, yet the safest driving record of anyone in society. So we have growth and loss. En vieillissant, on devient plus fou et plus sage. In growing old, we become more mad and more wise, said La Rochefoucauld. And people forget the more wise bit. So in our education, we try to emphasize the fantastic things that happen in later life as a metaphor. And true, for example, we've created a CD of late life music. And some of the greatest and most radical music comes from late life. For example, Janacek only took off in his 50s, greatest music in his 70s, Bach Foré, down at the bottom right. People didn't understand his late nocturnes, they were so radical. So this helps us break the idea that somehow or other people, older people are more conventional. And it's not just a matter of uh, the arts. If we look to politics, we can see that some of the greatest leaders of the last century were people in retirement age. Mannerheim of Finland, taken out of retirement at 72, de Gaulle at 67, Churchill. Would you prefer to be led by the young Churchill who led the disaster at Gallipoli, or do you want the older Churchill, the one who helped them win World War II? Golda Meir started her great career at the age of 67. So these are important metaphors that translate, if you look carefully, because the discourse of pensions and public funding is what a draw older people are on society. But in fact, this is because they nearly always have only public funding. Look at Clint Eastwood up there in the right-hand corner. Is he a burden on society at the age of 78 in Gran Torino? Look at Leonard Cohen at the age of 73, making nine and a half million on his tour. And this translates into ordinary everyday life. The economist Kevin Murphy has pointed out the economic longevity bonus, 3.2 trillion to the US, 1.3 million for each US citizen, and UCL in London this year has brought out a report that emphasized a 40 billion economic longevity bonus to the UK economy from older people. But if you only look at public transfers, it looks like a loss. Put public and private together and we're winning. Older people explain to us why this happens because most people say, how on earth can this be? And it happens through Baltus' theory is one of the ways of explaining this, selection, optimization and compensation. And this older pianist, Arthur Rubinstein, beautifully explained this to us. When people said, how come you're still playing into your 80s so well? He said, he didn't realize Baltus' theory, but he explained it without knowing it. I select more carefully the pieces I play, so I don't play the really, really difficult ones. I then optimize, because I practice now much more in my 80s than when I was a young chap in my 60s. But most importantly, is that, and this is the genius of aging, that our measures don't often measure. When there's a fast piece, I play the slow piece before it more slowly, so the fast piece appears just as fast as it used to. <laughs> and we find this all the time. When people come into me in my clinic and say, how come my mother is falling? I say, actually, your mother has so many disabilities. The real question is, how come she's still standing up? And it's the genius of her compensation. Okay. There is a danger, if you talk about the gains of later life, is that you will somehow or other not be balanced. So we've got to have this balance, that we understand that it's growth and loss, 
and that we take the two together. And artists come to our rescue. And as we're in a Nordic country, I turn to uh, Edvard Munch and his self-portrait, Milam Klocken, his self-portrait of the clock. And this captures fabulously loss and gains. On the one hand, he's there isolated, lonely, a man who is a celebrated woman's man. He has a single bed beside him. But then stop. Look at the colors. Look at the statement. Do you want this painting? Yes, you want this painting. Look at the clock. There's no hands on the clock. Time has begun to take less meaning. And then paintings of his, of, of his former women conquests and love. So we get desolation, isolation, the single bed, richness. We get the whole package. And in terms of our care, we need to turn to these to older people and to listen to person-centered care. Person-centered care can become a cliche. So let's look at an 83-year-old. This is one of Dr. Seuss's only two books that are not for children. This is a book for adults. And it's about the indignities of a care that does not bring together this complexity. And as you can see from his wonderful picture, he had said he had so many ailments that, that his social life had become exclusively with doctors. But he shows us the type of indignities that are heaped on us, for example, by polypharmacy, if we don't tailor our care adequately to later life. So we've got to listen to these things and change our care. And change we have. The most revolutionary radical in the care of older people was Dame Marjorie Warren, who understood she was given a large nursing home in the 1940s. And she said, instead of keeping them in bed and giving them Zimmer frames and giving them catheters, let's find out why they're not walking. Let's find out, can we get them back on their feet again? So it was diagnostic rather than prosthetic. Function was a key measure and very much incorporating the sciences of gerontology. And Burton Reifler, an old age psychiatry, has beautifully explained the difference between generic care and gerontological care. He says it's the difference between a souffle and a pancake. A souffle and a pancake are both made with the same ingredients, just as the team is made of the same ingredients, flour, butter, eggs, and milk. But what is the difference? The difference is expertise so you know how to do it. Diligence, so you pen pay attention to detail. Time, and that's a key challenge in developing services for older people. You've got to front load it with time to save you time further down. But most importantly, you've got to want to do it. And the proof of the pudding or the souffle is that this approach is dramatically and radically powerful. We know that acute geriatric, if you go into an emergency department, and the left-hand door is geriatric medicine, and the right-hand door is internal medicine, with much the same staffing, you will reduce your chances of death and going to a nursing home by 25%. And this carries through because it only works in a ward where you've got gerontological nurses. So it's not the doctors, it's the team, it's the approach, it's the training of all the staff. And this carries through into the community from Burna Bay's studies of community interventions. Now, we do not need a geriatrician for every older person, but for those who have needs, we need gerontologically trained staff. The sort of skill base we need to give our workers, whether it's care attendants, whether it's physiotherapists, social workers are, to understand aging and to understand that it is a longevity dividend to understand disability sciences because they have been the key, perhaps, to introducing the social into the biopsychosocial, to understand rehabilitation, integration, advocacy, both individual and societal, and expertise in the diseases and syndromes of aging. So that if you have dementia care training, you will understand that your patient or your client or your resident no longer remembers what a fork is, no longer recognizes food, is not hungry. So when somebody they don't know is pointing a sharp, shiny object with sludge on it at them, no wonder they don't want to eat. And by understanding these elements of dementia care, you understand that finger food is something they will understand and feed at their own pace. We have a window of opportunity. There is not a tsunami of disability. 
Although we are all accumulating more labels because we're diagnosed earlier with blood pressure, diagnosed earlier with diabetes, in fact, the levels of significant disability are dropping. Cara Christensen here, with, along with Vopel, have shown this quite convincingly. And the rate of disability among older Americans, for example, is dropping at 1.5% a year. Now, our services are underdeveloped. In Ireland, we have 1,000 social workers for child abuse. We have 30 for elder abuse. If we should have as many as child abuse says, we should have 600. So this flattening off of the curve says, no, it's not a tsunami, but this high level suggests we've got to do better in the services we've got. We've got to have a common med model across social care, health care, indeed, We've got to try and get rid of this division between health and social care and respect each other and stop using words like medical model as an insult because the biopsychosocial is the model we should all be looking at and we need to be salutogenic and that has to become more than a slogan and a cliche. We need a common language and again I think it's really important that we stop all trying to invent our own mousetrap and look at, there is a better mousetrap out there, the inter -eye. It's used in th over 30 countries. It has hospital, community, and nursing home versions. It is the Esperanto, or perhaps the English, dare I say, of gerontology. And most importantly, it updates with gerontological and caring sciences. But finally, our emphasis must be on full citizenship. There are major concerns around eligibility, entitlement, and ageism. For example, many European countries stop breast screening, breast cancer screening at 65. You are seven times more likely to get breast cancer and seven times more likely to die of breast cancer after the age of 65. And one of our great challenges is that we do not have outrage from the women's organizations across Europe about this separation from their older sisters. And indeed, it is a great foolishness because older people are us as we age, and we will be over 65 in time, and we will be those who will not get breast cancer screening. And we need access to expertise. We would think it unthinkable to send our children to a general physician, to an adult internist. We want them to go to a pediatrician. We need to think we want a gerontologically trained care worker, we want a gerontologically trained social worker, we want a gerontologically trained family doctor. So the good news story. I showed you a piece from The Lancet five years ago where they left out competence. Well, actually, this year, they decided maybe, with a lot of work from gerontologists and geriatricians, maybe competence is worthwhile. And what we're striving towards is a care system where expertise is no longer discretionary. And indeed, perhaps the finest moment, I have to say, the moment where I felt that the idea of the longevity dividend has come of age was a cover of The Lancet this year, which I'll read out. Aging is most often framed in negative terms, questioning whether health services, welfare provision, and economic growth are sustainable. We argue that, instead of being portrayed as a problem, increased human longevity should be a cause for celebration. And we have to believe that, and we have to develop an articulacy. And I think in terms of really what is a new venture for most of us, can I turn to the words of T.S. Eliot, that each venture is a new beginning, a raid on the inarticulate, and I think that's our opportunity today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill, for these uh, words, and I think we're not afraid to get old now. The best is yet to come. So there is uh, some room left for questions to our three uh, speakers. Is if you have a question, say your name and the person uh, you want to ask the question to. Who will start? My name is Goodell Bembra. I am from London Borough of Redbridge, which is in London. My question is regarding young people. Um, in fact, both of you described the position that we're in in Europe, and both of you sort of mentioned a uh, number of young people who are, uh, who are neat. Uh, we're talking about anything from 7% to around 50%. My question simply is, yes, we need to spend a lot of money, invest a lot of money to make sure these uh, needs, in fact, are brought into 
um, either they're working or going into work experience or going into further education. I mean, in fact, I call it as volunteering as well. These jobs you, you talk about at the moment, um, I'm, the quest, my question to you is this, where are these jobs going to come from? Yes, we can spend a lot of money on it. We can promise them. I know Finland, for example, the example you gave, for example, is that Finland, the population is pretty low. So in fact, the need in there are a very small percentage. Where the rest of Europe, you're talking about big, big figures. So the main, main question is, where are these jobs going to come from? Are, or are we going to disappoint a lot of these young people? Perhaps Mrs. Terudan can start. Um, yes, can you all see me or should I stand up? Should I stand up? Yeah, okay. Well, I, have, I, I would like to, to say also um, that, that I've been working a lot on youth unemployment. Uh, I feel that I'm not only representing the Greens in the parliament and my party here from Denmark, but I'm also representing a generation um, that is paying a very high price for the crisis for the moment. And I think your question is very well put, because you're right, I've been fighting a lot for this youth guarantee that is now a European concept. But in the end, can we keep, keep it going with, with a guarantee? Because it's, some, it's a crisis measure, it's not really su sustainable jobs. And I think, to be honest, nobody really knows where the jobs will come from in Europe, and that's the big tragedy. So we haven't managed to build a new competitiveness strategy for our societies. So when I visited ECB, so the central bank, they were still talking about limiting wages as a competitiveness strategy, and I just asked them how low should we go, because can we ever catch up with China, or should we think of our future job creation our, and our, uh, our production in a more clever way? For example, by reducing energy uh, con energy uh, levels, by limiting our resource use, uh, by being those, by having the most uh, well-educated workforce. I mean, there are so many uh, challenges we haven't ta managed yet. So I, 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 I don't mean to disappoint you. I just want to say I think nobody really has figured out where the jobs will come from, and that's what we need to invest in. While we try to save the banks, also we should we should think about this. Thank you. Yeah, I may add uh, something, actually, uh, yeah, nobody knows uh, where from where the job will, uh, will come from, uh, obviously. But anyway, there are jobs around, uh, but there are, not so many, but there are, but there are mismatches. And I think that we should invest in order to solve these mismatches. These are skill mismatches, for example, but not just skill mismatching, also geographical mismatching is a thing that where we could uh, work uh, and solving this mismatching in order to fill the vacancies that are available with uh, young uh, workers. Alfonso? Good morning, Alfonso Montero from European Social Network, from the Secretariat. I have a couple of questions. The first one is for Emily. Um, we are seeing now that um, we are being told that the economic model is not sustainable, that we have to look for a new economic model. That's how you started your presentation. And we are being told by um, certain country and by the international institutions that um, the way should be mainly austerity, that we have to embrace that austerity, that it, this is actually how we are going to get out of the crisis. And we are seeing that uh, new policies are being implemented according to them, but those policies remind us of policies that were implemented in certain countries in the 80s that caused a huge amount of poverty and actually a lost generation. I would like to ask you from your perspective, is that the new economic model and is that sustainable? That's the first question for you and also for, um, for Massimiliano. I come from a region in the south of Spain which is actually hit by the crisis where there is a huge amount of young people who are unemployed, who are not in training, education. And they tell me, um, for us it's very hard to get out of this situation because uh, we may be just offered a contract for 200, 250 euros. Is that really the way out of this? Uh, in the meantime, they tell us, um, we are being told that we need to work, to work harder and longer until the age of 67, the age of 70. 
So I'd like to ask you, do you think that promoting that retirement age has to be delayed may cause difficulties in people, young people assessing the labor market? Well, you're pointing to the big debate for the moment in Europe. So how will we overcome the crisis? Have the current economic policies been successful? I think we all know they have not. So economically, we are, we are trapped in a, in a debt spiral going actually downwards. So de deficits and debts are crawling up while we try to cut public spending. And I mean, basically, we, we, we killed an economic upswing last year and we're in recession again. And I think that's, that's a realization we have to have. So economically, austerity alone is not sustainable. I think that's very clear. Also, socially, it has huge consequences. That's, I mean, I mean even in Denmark, we have very limited public spending these years, even in Denmark. And when I look at what happens in Spain and Greece, it's, um, it's a heavy social price indeed. And environmental, well, yeah, there are lower, lower emissions due to the drop in GDP growth. But what we are doing now is just trying to go back to status quo. So we are trying to kickstart the old growth machine. So we will m maybe end up in a in the same place with the, with the old growth model. So I think we need, as I said, to rethink these three elements over again. Uh, it's starting now. I sense a little bit of uh, new intellectual thinking being put into this. I think the left, I'm, I'm, I'm from a leftist party, we, we cannot go back to financing this crisis with the more debt. We cannot do that either. So everybody has to rethink the way we want to deal with this crisis. Uh, and that's about employment, it's about competitiveness, uh, but it's also about not killing what actually works in Europe. So Denmark, this country, it's a rich country. It's rich because we managed to do a lot of things at one time. We have a huge welfare state. Is it a burden? No, it's actually also an engine for economic activity. Because who takes care of the kids? when the parents go to work, that's the public sector. I mean, who I mean, th there are so many uh, interactions that you, you, you cannot underestimate. So the ECB president, Mario Draghi, he said recently, the European social model is dead. I think he meant it's too expensive, let's, let's cut it, let's scrap it. Uh, I, think, uh, I think that's not the direction. I think we need to look at what actually works but also knowing we cannot finance this crisis with more debt. So it's a very delicate balance. And I, I am a little bit optimistic these days. I was not two weeks ago, three weeks ago, two months ago, but I think things are changing. I'm hoping at least, and I, I'm hoping to contribute to that also. Thank you.